where is the original Quran? Where is the seventh century complete Quran? Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this series that we're doing with Dr. J. Smith about the early uh, Islamic history or the standard Islamic narrative. Uh, today we are asking a fundamental question about the Quran. Where is the original Quran? Where is the 7th century complete Quran? And with me here in studios to answer this question and interact with me is Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J. Uh, I grew up as a Muslim, believing that the Quran that I have in my hand is the exact replica of the Quran that I found in heaven, the Quran that was revealed to Muhammad, the Quran that was put together by Uthman, the complete Quran. And here it is. Right? This is the original, complete Uthmanic recension. This is the one that you have been told exists in heaven, sent down to Muhammad over a 22-year period, finalized by Muhammad when he died, and then printed out in its in its book form by Zaidi bin Thabit, the secretary of Muhammad, yeah. who was commissioned by Uthman in 652 yeah. to write that. If you can turn this towards the camera, and I want him to zoom in, there is something interesting that people can see um, uh, on the book. You are going to start to see some red letters in there, which is interesting. Okay, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there. These are all red letters, there's some blue letters as well, and there's green letters. Now, we're going to be getting to that later on, right. but certainly this is what they call the original Quran. Now, of course, this has been published in the 21st century, printed right. in the 21st century. It's the facsimile, it's the manuscripts from this is derived that are from the 7th century. Why? Well, let's look and see what the standard Islamic narrative tells us. So let's go to the slide and let's unpack it. According to the standard Islamic narrative, not according to you, not according to me, this is what every Muslim believes, this is what every Muslim has been told. In the 7th century, we note, uh, I want you to note the cities which I'm going to put up in the countries where the earliest Qurans were created. So Muhammad dies in 632. He, the Quran is not written down when he dies. It is not written down like this at all. There's we don't no, have any evidence that it was. Well, even, in the, even the traditions don't say that. No. And Al-Buhari, you need to go to Al-Buhari, uh, uh, volume 6, hadith number 509. Hadith number 509 gives the story of how the Quran was put together, and it's very clear that there was no written Quran in 632. So when Muhammad dies, they have this battle in 632 to 634. Abu Bakr is, uh, is the caliph, and the, at the battle, a number of those who had memorized the Quran died. So there's a crisis on their hand, because if all those who memorized the Quran died, then there's no Quran. So they get Zaidi Mutabid, who is the secretary of Muhammad, to write the Quran down. So he does that in 632. 32, not 62, but 632. Gives the copy to Umar, who gives it to his daughter Hafsa, who used to be one of the wives of Muhammad. She sticks it under her bed and leaves it there for 20 years. Rather odd that she leaves it there for 20 years. In 652, there's another battle. This one is not at Yamama, the first one. This one is in Azerbaijan. And after the battle with the Syrian Muslims and the Iraqi Muslims, they go to the mosque to pray and to recite the Quran. And these Iraqis and the Syrians are reciting it different than those from Medina. That's right. And Hudaifa, who is there, who's in charge of that, he is angered and he starts coming to fisticuffs, blows with them, and he biddles down, back down to Medina and says to Uthman, we've got a problem here. We've got to get the Quran in one version. Otherwise, it's going to be like the Christians who have many different Bibles. We must have just one Quran in one dialect. And he has Zaidi bin Tabi take that book that had been hidden under the bed and rewrites the Quran. He rewrites it in the Qurayshi dialect. That happens in 652. So that is this book right here. According to every Muslim I know, that's this book. Let's put it up the right side up. That's this book right here. Now, if that is the case, what happens next? Well, let's say what he does. He then sends it out five copies to these five cities. You notice I'm putting them up there on the screen. Uh, they, uh, the, the three the two green ones is Mecca and Medina there uh, down in the south. And then you have Basra uh, there at the head of this Persian Gulf. You have Kufa and then you have Damascus. So five cities, Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Medina. Two in Iraq, one in Damascus in Syria, and two in Arabia. Sent to five said, why? So that these become the standard. And so that there will be no the difficulties, there will be no dislocation, and certainly there will be no other Quran. So this is a standardization process. This is a censorship because he doesn't want what happened up there in Azerbaijan. 
When he does that, he it's interesting because when you go to Al Buhari, Hadith, uh, volume six, Hadith number five ten, it says that he takes all these other Qurans that were from Iraq and um, from Damascus, which is Syria, and he burns them, burns them, burns them. Why? Because they're different. They're different writing. Now you're an Arab speaker, and you know that to burn. Uh, dialectical differences, you need something to show the dialectical differences in an Arabic script. What is it you need to have to show these dialectical differences, the vowelizations that you have in the script? What do you need to have to do that in an Arabic script? Well, we're going to need uh, dotting, we need uh, uh, diacritical markings, you know, things like that to help you reading. Right. Yeah. We say potato, you say potato, we say tomato, you say tomato. There is, between the British and the Americans, we have different ways of saying it, and those are vowelization differences, and you write them differently depending on what it is. In the same way in Arabic, you need to show the differences. In a script, you need to have vowelization. You need the dama, the kasra, the fata. You need to have the dots. Mm -hmm. You need the five dots, three above and two below. Dots and vowels didn't exist in 652. Is that a problem for you? Uh, of course, because uh, we are looking, I mean, you know that I'm looking at early Quranic manuscripts, and by looking at the Quranic manuscripts that are considered to be in the first 200 years, uh, n not all of them, especially the early one, have any uh, basically systems to help you in pronouncing the words. In fact, those were added later because they recognize the problem. You look at a, a bare word without dottings or markations, and it's an open game. You can read it however you feel the context might so indicate. So how could there be dialectical difference in written in a written text that can be burned? Well, you don't burn someone's pronunciation that's right. from their lips. Exactly. You, don't you burn, burn their something their... that is completely different, right? You can or see, disagrees with you. You can see this is 9th century Buhari redacting his back into the 7th century. In the 9th century, there would have been yeah. dots and vowels. He is speaking about his own time. And this is a common error all the way through the traditions. They assume that what they know, uh, like the dialectical differences in a written text, existed in the 7th century. They didn't do a historical survey. We know that there were only 16 letters. They didn't have dots and vowels that early. So you cannot have Uthman collecting scripts that were different, that were not and burning them, obviously, this is a historical anachronism. And I want to add one more thing. I mean, you know that I'm looking at the Sana'a manuscripts. If the idea of burning something that does not really fit the bill match the, the reading, then why in the world we discovered a huge, basically, uh, trove of evidence that manuscripts were actually protected, stored in, basically, an attic rather than being burned? I want to also just show this, put this up. Uh, this is the Kira'ats. We're going to get into this later. Mm -hmm. These are the Kira'ats. And these are the seven that, according to every Muslim, were the seven readings, the seven dialects, that's what every Muslim says, that existed at the time of Muhammad. These were given by Jibril to Muhammad, the seven readings, because when Muhammad was reciting it, the people from other areas could not understand who he was saying. So Jibbal gave him seven readings. I just want to show you the cities that these seven readings come from. Uh, Nafi comes from Medan, Medina. Okay, that could be Qureshi. Ibn Kathir comes from Mecca. That would be Qureshi. Abu Amr comes from Basra. That is Iraq. Ibn Amir comes from Damascus. That's Syria. Asim, Hamza, and al Qasai all come from Kufa. That's Iraq. So of the seven, Four of them come from Iraq and Syria, the very places where these were burned. Yet these are the seven that supposedly existed at the time of Muhammad. That's if right. that is the case, you've got a real problem here. Why would he be burning th the very things that the seven, the major seven, the Kirat, these are the readings, the, the creme de la creme, the, the best of the best, as Yasser Qadi always calls them. That's Why right. would he be burning the very things that actually where they came from? Yeah, at best case scenario, it's a political issue. At worst case, we have different Qurans. More than that, you're going to see, I haven't given you the dates. That's coming for another episode. When you look at the dates, these are all 8th, 9th, and 10th century Qurans. Not one of them is from the time of Muhammad. It's not even from the same century as Muhammad. Speaking of that, what would be the next episode? Well, we're not finished yet. We're not finished. I want to take a look at this map again. Go back to this map because then something else happens in the 7th century. Suddenly, three other of uh, Quran start to appear. One in Damascus written by Uba ibn Qab, and it has 116 surahs. 116 you're supposed to have 114. That's two more series than what are needed. Another appears in uh, Baghdad, written by a guy named Ibn Masud, and he only has 110 surahs. That's four less than what's in the Quran. And some even argue 111, but still it's missing few. 
it's, it doesn't have as many as the one yeah. that Zaid ibn Thabit has or the one that we have today. And Ibn Musa has 114, but it's not the same surahs. So you have three different Qurans in three different cities. Notice where the red circles are. They're all in Iraq and in uh, Syria. That's hundreds of miles or f further north. And what's interesting, so we have five Qurans set to five cities. We don't have one of these Qurans today. Not one of these Qurans that we have today to look at. We don't have Zaid ibn Tabits, we don't have Uba ibn Qabs, we don't have Ibn Masuds, we don't have Ibn Musa. How do we know about these Qurans? It's the Islamic standard Islamic narratives that tell us about these Qurans. And when Dr. Arthur Jeffrey looked at the standard Islamic narrative, he found 15,000 differences between those three and Zaid ibn Tabits. 15,000 differences. And I have his document and I'm going through it myself right now. Can you then see there's a problem here? Absolutely. Huge problem. What's next? We're going to look at some of the manuscripts that we do have today. Wonderful. And I think everybody is excited already when it comes to the manuscripts of the Quran. It's very damaging, really, because that's what the foundation of Islam is resting on. Until next time, have a blessed day.